Wow. Hasn't this been a good day already? Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning about the road from Emmaus. Uh, would you turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 24? And I'll back up here in just a moment and give you a little, little background of this. But we'll pick up the reading in uh, verse 36 of Luke chapter 24. We normally hear messages, the uh, road to Emmaus. I want to speak about from Emmaus this morning. So now as they, that is the disciples, said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why uh, do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And I just want to pause long enough to note there, he is the risen Christ at this point. Notice what's left out. He says flesh and bones. Blood. As an eternal being, you and I will not have blood. And everybody said, hallelujah. Right? Yeah, that's, that's a whole other teaching, so pardon me. But on verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission for, of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations, people groups, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Can you say amen to the reading of God's word? You. you know, in most of our considerations of the scriptural account that we've given here of, of the Emmaus story, we read from verses uh, 13 to verse 35. We're pretty familiar with that, most of us who have, who have been in church very long, but we usually stop there. But this morning I picked up our, uh, the story at verse 36 because here is as radio personality Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. And the rest of the story adds tremendous, tremendous meaning. So this morning, uh, I want to talk to you not about the walk to Emmaus, but the walk from Emmaus. You know, have you uh, heard the story of the high-powered business executive uh, who boarded the New Orleans to Washington train? Uh, he was a heavy sleeper, and he needed to be awakened in order to get off of the train uh, in Atlanta at 5 o'clock in the morning. And he had an extremely important business meeting there, and so he found the porter, and he got a hold of him, and he told him, I want you to awaken me in order to get off the train by 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, I'm a heavy sleeper, and it doesn't matter how much I fight, fuss, fume, uh, you know, or, or what I do to you, I have to get off this train in Atlanta. And I, if you have to remove me bodily, you get me off this train in Atlanta. Well, the next morning, he woke up at 9 o'clock, having slept all night, missed Atlanta, and found he was speeding his way to Washington. And so he found that porter, and he really let him have it with all kinds of abusive language. You, you can understand what, what I'm talking about here. Almost attacking the poor guy. 
After he left, someone said to the porter, he said, how in the world could you allow that guy to speak to you like that? And the porter said, hey, that's nothing. You should have heard the guy I put off in Atlanta. <laughs> Many of us not only fail to get off at the right station, but we miss the train. Too many of us, and by that I mean Christ followers, I'm afraid, miss the train of the total gospel message. That's the reason we have to read the rest of the story, and we have to think about the walk from Emmaus. Our Christian faith is not a uh, destination, loved ones. It's not a destination, not an uh, arrival at some point, but rather it's a journeying. It's a walk from Emmaus. I'm going to share with you a, a quick phrase, and then we'll back up and talk about it a little bit more later in this message. But do you know it's possible to become a Christian but never become a disciple? Let's get the setting in mind, first of all. Picture it with me, if you would. After recognizing Jesus when he broke bread with him down at Emmaus, Cleopas... Uh, and his companion returned at once to Jerusalem. And they, they hurried to the room where the eleven, those with them, were all assembled together. And they discovered that they were saying to each other, It's true, the Lord has certainly risen, and he appeared to Simon. That is Peter. And so these two could verify that very fact, that he had risen. They told what had happened to them on the way, and they recognized Jesus when he broke bread with them, and that's where we pick the story up there in verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Can you imagine what that would have been like, that moment? I mean, they didn't hear him come through the door or anything. He just appeared and said, Peace be with you. Uh, it would have, it, you know, they thought they had, uh, they were not only frightened, but they thought they'd seen a ghost. Uh, they, they were ghosted, I guess, but that's wrong use anyway. But isn't that just like us? Here they had just been talking about the reason, you know, that Christ has risen. You know, he was alive, and they had been talking about seeing him, and they knew that, and they had that testimony and assuring each other that indeed it had happened and that Jesus was no longer dead, but very, very much alive. But now Jesus appears to them as they gathered there and they couldn't believe it. They were frightened and they thought it was a ghost. And it caused me to pause and think, how many times maybe, very possibly, how many times does Jesus come to us and we don't recognize him. How many times has he come to us in the midst of some, something we're going through and we don't recognize him? Jesus did with his small group gathered there in the upper room what he had done with Cleopas and, the, and his companion on the road to Emmaus. He illuminated scripture. That's what he tends to do. Look at verses 46 and 47 here. He says... Then he said to them, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Here again is the central message of Christianity. Loved ones, never, never forget this. The central message of Christianity is the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. Jesus revealed it on the walk to Emmaus and the walk from Emmaus. And at the center of the Christian faith is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not just jewelry. It's not something, a symbol we stick up on the top of church houses or in the front or up on the, up on the walls just as a, a decorative item. It's the center. It's the core of what Christianity is all about. So let's nail this down today. The walk from Emmaus involves the cross. Nothing, absolutely nothing, reveals the heart of God like the cross does. 
And it's been said, when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. That was my dad's favorite gospel song. When he was on the cross, you and I, we were on his mind. Jesus stated emphatically to Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, verses 25 and 26, if you go back just a little bit there in chapter 24, it says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe and all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Wow. This is our salvation that he's talking about here. We claim it. We celebrate it. But I have a challenging word for you today. If at Emmaus we are claimed and affirmed in our salvation through the cross, then our walk from Emmaus involves our taking up the cross and doing something about it. So we're taking up the cross. It's entirely possible for a person to become a Christian, but never become a disciple. And I'm afraid, and I'm quite concerned, loved ones, that that's where so many people are today. Do they want to miss the flames of hell? Do they not want to uh, miss heaven and, or, or, or miss God? Yes, they don't want that. And so they will give their lives over to the Lord. They will, they will claim the gift of salvation from the cross. That's the road to Emmaus, if you please. But it's what happens from there that causes us to grow and, and to be an active part of why Jesus came. He came for our salvation, but he saved us for a purpose. We're to be about doing something. It isn't just coming to church. It isn't just, I got to say it, <laughs> James, it isn't just eating tacos, man. <laughs> Although if you want to bless Pastor James, you just take him for a taco. He'll love you for life, you know. I mean, he's a taco-eating dude, I'll tell you. But we have a purpose to fulfill as Christ's followers. And that's, that's what he's talking about here. Um, Becoming disciple of the Lord, not just a Christian, but a true follower. That's what the word disciple means, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here the Apostle Paul knew all about that. He was a man of one passion, and his passion was to know Christ. You remember that? How many times did he say it in Scripture? To know Christ. And he knew that knowing Christ involved the cross itself and for himself as well. Remember the, the uh, radical expression of his deep passion of his life over in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 when he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his what? Suffering. Becoming like him in his death. This was such a radical part of the Apostle Paul's life that he never ceased talking about it. You'll find it all through his writings. He wrote to the Colossians, and I quote, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still uh, lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is Christ. Now it's a, a, a strange and somewhat confusing word, and some may, because of that, charge Paul with thinking that somehow Christ's suffering was insufficient for human sin, and that he had to do something about it. But that isn't the issue at all. That's not it at all. There's nothing deficient in Christ's reconciling sacrifice. What Paul is expressing is, that, is what he sought to live out as the deepest desire of his heart and life, to join in the fellowship of Christ's suffering. Listen, we are, <laughs> he's calling for a pattern, the pattern of Christ's own saving work to be incorporated in the life of every Christ follower, of every believer. That we would reproduce that kind of passion, the willingness to suffer if it, if it takes that, to give ourselves in a cross style of, of life, of living. 
Campbell McAlpine, a true saint and prophet of God who's gone on to be with the Lord now, had a memorable saying about our relationship to the cross. And he's from Wales, has a little different look at things, but an amazing man of God. And he said this, Kiss frequently the cross which the Lord sends you, without regard of what sort they may be. The merit of the cross, or of crosses, does not consist of their weight, but in the manner in which they are carried. The cross. Now that sounds so very strange, doesn't it? You know, kiss frequently the crosses which the Lord sends you. If we get beyond the strangeness of the image, we'll discover the truth that we are to welcome the suffering that comes into our lives as an invitation to love and to trust Almighty God even more. Isn't that what happens to us, loved ones? When we are experiencing something, a, a, a pain, a discomfort of some kind, a, a, a brokenness of relationship, or whatever, we, we go to, <laughs> and we, try, we discover God more, more depth in him than we had known before. And to make our suffering an extension of the suffering of Christ. Let me ask you, what, Christ, what cross in your life do you most need to kiss? What cross in your life today do you most need to kiss? I know some of them because uh, I've been asked to pray for a bunch of them. Uh, the cross that you carry for a child caught in the chains of destructive addiction Disabled parents for whom you're having to care for. An unsatisfactory job that's apparently the only means of survival for your family right now. Being a single parent because an irresponsible, uncaring spouse left you. The call to serve the poor and the needy. The life of purity <coughs> as a single person. What cross in your life do you need to kiss. I think the bigger question is, are you willing to give yourself for the sake of others and for the world? Expand that thought just a little bit. As the bread and juice of Holy Communion, which we're going to be partaking of in just a moment, is the body of Christ broken for us and the blood poured out on our behalf, uh, so Christ would want us to be the bread broken for the sake of the world and the blood poured out for the salvation of others. Can you say amen to that? That can't happen, dear ones, without a willingness to suffer on the part of those following Christ. An excellent example of, the, of that, of what I'm talking about here, is the amazing, even miraculous story and I hope I get these pronunciations right because this is a, Chuck, uh, uh, <laughs> a Czechoslovakian man, but his name is Vaclav Malik. Vaclav Malik. Uh, he was a Catholic priest in Czechoslovakia who in 1981 was defrocked for preaching the gospel and was dispatched by the communists in the, in the government to clean the toilets in the subway system of Prague. Think about that. He frocked as the priest in that community and sentenced to clean the toilets in the subway system in Prague. On Christmas Eve, 1989, this is a factual, very true story. Christmas Eve, 1989, when the crowds began to move out into the streets, when it looked like finally the communist power structure had been overturned. <laughs> the crowd started ch chanting, Male, 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 over and over again. He was doing the job he was condemned to do. He was down in the subway system cleaning toilets. So up out of the subway he came, this defrocked priest. He led the crowd down the main square of Old Prague, and the New York Times, our New York Times, told the story. 
back in 1989. It was probably believable back then. But anyway, that's another story for another time. But 800,000 people, 800,000 people gathered around while Molly uh, administered the service in that square and offered forgiveness for all of the communists in that nation. All they had to do was come forward and repent, and they did by the hundreds. The TV personalities and those recording this and taking note of it were stunned. They couldn't believe what was happening. Some of you may even remember that particular event. The next morning, the tanks were gone from the square. They called it the Velvet Revolution. Not a single drop of blood was shed, and Malley was the hero of the Velvet Res Revolution, the power of the cross in one person's life. Isn't that incredible? His right life reflected at least an echo of what Paul said. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Let me put it this way. We must walk from Emmaus carrying a cross. Carrying the cross. Then there is the this truth in the story of the walk from Emmaus, it's there in verses 47 and 48. Look at it. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. John's gospel tells a story in a slightly different way. The frightened disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ gathered in fear behind locked doors. And we know the story pretty well. Jesus had been crucified, and they were afraid for the vengeful uh, enemies of Jesus that would seek them out and, and destroy them. And so Jesus came to those men locked behind the, <laughs> the, the door in that room, and the scripture says he came and he simply stood in their midst. Whoa! <laughs> Man. When Jesus showed them the nail prints in his hands and the wound in his side, the scripture said they were glad. Why? When I see something like that, my, my mind just explodes. Why? Why were they glad all of a sudden? Well, because the, the marks, the scars, prove that the cru crucified Christ had actually risen and was now alive and among them. Incredible proof. After showing them his nail-scarred hands, he then commissioned them, saying, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And I, I wrote my notes here. Wait a minute. What's going on here? What's going on here? These men were hiding out. They were actually fearful. They were cowards at that moment in time. Frightened, out of their wits. Vulnerable. Quite helpless. Yet it's to this ragtag group that Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. He commissions them to the same ministry that he had, they had been performing with him for the past three years. Healing the sick, forgiving sins, giving hope, reconciling people, calling people to new life. He commissioned them to do that very thing. He's calling these weak, frightened, bewildered, helpless disciples to be about the mighty work of the kingdom of God. And again, I wrote in my notes, well, how in the world could that be? How could the master do something like that with these, with these guys just trembling with fear, hiding out for fear of their lives? Well, quite, fr quite frankly, it can't be unless something else happens. So the scripture says, Jesus breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. As God had breathed life into the first man and he became a living soul, so Jesus shares the intimacy of his own life with his disciples that they might become a new community. Now remember, this is before the day of Pentecost. Before Pentecost. These disciples were given a foretaste of the Holy Spirit that would come and then finally remain in them permanently after Jesus had returned to his father. 
Remember how he tried to prepare them for his death? He told them that he was going to go back to his father. And what did he promise that uh, he would do uh, when he did? He said that he would send who? The Holy Spirit. And what would the Holy Spirit do? He would give them power to just go around doing miracles, to just go ahead and mesmerize everybody they came in touch with. No. Power to do what? To do what he commissioned them to do. To go in the world and preach the gospel, to make disciples of those who follow Jesus Christ. Give them power to do that. Authority to do that. That's powerful stuff. He said, power. For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And here in Luke, it, look at verse uh, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Why did he say that? Because he knew they didn't have it in them. They couldn't have done it without the power of the Holy Spirit. And loved ones, you and I can't either. We won't either. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. That's part of the problem, isn't it? You know, we have often not been endued with power from, from on high. We often disregard the spectacular power that the Holy Spirit offers to us and from him alone. We trust Jesus with some things some of the time. <laughs> but we need to trust him with all things all of the time. Somebody could say amen right there. You missed a good spot to say amen. If you were a black church, you'd be saying amen, all right? That's not racist, by the way. Hello. I just know my brothers, you know? Somebody say amen. <laughs> okay. Now I sound like Pastor James. Anyway. Uh, uh, anyway. Um, we need the presence of the Holy Spirit creating the kind of fellowship where one loving heart sets another heart on fire, sets it on fire. We often disregard the spectacular power of the Holy Spirit. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit creating the kind of fellowship where one loving heart, as I said, sets another on fire. Let me ask you, when was the last time you made a real sacrifice for the sake of Christ? When was the last time you took yourself, uh, took upon yourself what I call a cross of love, a burden you couldn't bear in your own power, a burden of another, maybe a parent, a brother, a sister, still lost in sin, a friend str struggling with low self-esteem, so low that he or, hers, uh, he or she hangs on to, the, to you for everything and drains you emotionally. A child who is in the far country, if you please, a lifelong friend who has turned their back on you. Are you willing to take up a cause that's so heavy? The cause of loving and serving poor and needy, the cause of racial reconciliation, the cause of helping to save our culture from rampant pornography. It's not getting better. The cause of saving children from abortion. The cause of world mission to an unsaved people group. The cause of <laughs> authentic, passionate evangelism for lost people. People far from God. A cause so heavy that only the power of the Holy Spirit will keep you on your knees and keep your knees from buckling as you stumble along under the cross and under that sacrifice. Pretty heavy thought, isn't it? Listen, the walk from Emmaus calls us to take up our cross, to kiss the crosses, if you please, in our lives, but also to stay in the city until we are endued with power from on high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Rio de Janeiro as a city is a study in contrast in a a number of years ago, I had the privilege of going on a mission trip down there to, uh, to Brazil. And uh, 
on the campus of one of the missionary couples that we supported as a church um, and ended up going to Rio de Janeiro. In one direction, you can see spectacular beaches and stretches that stretch from Ipanema to Copacabana, some of the finest beaches in all of the world. And along the beach and the sidewalks are tiled with mosaics and they're crowded with very beautiful people. Trendy as well as tacky hotels line one side of the most beautiful beaches in all of the world. And they truly are. They're incredible to see. But when you look in another direction, you see the largest favela in Brazil. Shantytown, a slum. Some estimates are that as many as a quarter million people are crowded into the tiny concrete block huts that are stacked there, one upon another, on the mountainside like a beehive. It's something really to behold. In fact, beehive is a literal translation of the word favela. That's exactly what it looks like. In the middle of that favela, a Christian organization has established an amazing ministry called the Hope Factory. The Hope Factory. It's a ministry with uh, commitment to and passion for the poor. And we were connected with the Hope Factory there. High above all of that, dominating the entire landscape of that beautiful city is the magnificent statue of Christ the Redeemer. And if you've seen a picture of that statue, you, if, if you've ever seen a picture of Rio de Janeiro, you've seen the picture of Christ the Redeemer. Um, it dominates everything. The Christ standing there, arms stretched out over the city. It's absolutely breathtaking. I had the privilege of <laughs> trying to walk up the steps, and there are a bazillion steps to get up to just the bottom of that statue but we could go up that thing. And they had one of the greatest torrential downpours of rain that they had had in years when we were attempting to do that. It was turning our umbrellas inside out. Uh, it was just a terrible, terrible thing. And as we could only get to the base of the statue, it, the, the Lord's feet were, were well above us. And it was so it, raining so heavily, we couldn't see above that. And we were that close to the statue. But it oversees the whole city and looks out. It's just spectacular. And Jesus faces the ocean. And that means that his back is toward the favela. And you don't see that in the pictures that they show us. They just see him from the back of Jesus looking out to the ocean. Behind him is where all these people in this poverty stricken beehive live. And on a particularly difficult day, one of the workers in the Hope Factory looked up and saw the back of the statue and felt that Jesus had turned his back on the people of the favela. It was a dark and dismal moment that began to breed hopelessness in this young woman's heart. And then one of the workers reminded her, listen, he called her by name, Jesus has not turned his back on us. He's leading us out. He's leading us out. I began this message by saying that the Christian faith is not a destination, not an arrival at some point, but rather it's a journey. It's a walk from Emmaus. Now that we know Jesus, it's a walk from Emmaus. That walk calls us to take up our cross daily, to kiss the crosses in our lives, but also to stay in the city until we're endued with power from on high. Knowing that Jesus Christ never turns his back on us, but he leads us on, on to life and on to sharing life with other people. Can you say amen to that? That's our purpose. That's what we're called to do. And that's what the Lord was getting across to these disciples, even before Pentecost, <laughs> that that's what their task is. So we need his grace every day to live out the Christ life. I know I certainly do, this spiritual journey. 
We need his grace for salvation to become Christ followers, to truly become disciples of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And loved ones, beyond anything else, after my salvation, beyond anything else, I want to be a devoted, full-fledged disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Totally committed, doing the work of the Lord, pleasing Him in everything I possibly can, in every way I possibly can. Studying the book so I know what that would be, what He would have me to do. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing. 